Hello, everyone, and welcome to Asset Management Awareness Month. My name is Kim Sager, and I'm the VP of Communications and Marketing. Today, we kick off our first of four webinars in our Awareness Month series. We have lots of great content coming your way all month long, so I hope you guys continue to join us. Before we get started and I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to run through some logistics. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our MPMA website and YouTube channel later this month. If you are logged in today and an active member of MPMA, uh, you will automatically get CEU credit. Lastly, if you have any questions during the presentation, please write them in the question box and we'll review them as we can. Um, our speaker today also did uh, give us the uh, PowerPoint presentation ahead of time, and that's listed in the handouts section um, of the GoToMeeting. And then now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Peter Collins. Peter is the president and CEO of A to B Tracking. He has worked with many industries, including the Department of Defense, on the development of auto ID policies, such as barcode and RFID. He has a wealth of knowledge in developing and implementing RFID and barcode asset tracking systems in organizations around the globe. Peter played a key role as a consultant to the DOD uh, in the department's efforts to adopt the use of IUID technology in 2004. He received the ID Global Leadership Award in 2009 for his role in worldwide adoption of IUID and is an active participant in the IUID industry trade association. Peter, welcome and thank you for joining us. My pleasure and uh, thanks for having me, Kim. Yeah, and of course, a, take it away. Yeah, and, and a special thanks to <clears throat> MPMA as well. It's It really is great to be part of uh, such a dedicated group of professionals like this organization that just continues to advance uh, their education and, and the professionals and the role that they play uh, in their industry. So for me as a member, an MPMA member for 18 years now, I can't stress enough the importance of this association. And I think it's great that this Asset Management Awareness Month um, comes at this time of year because it's really such a great time to learn uh, and for the property professionals to set time aside, hone their skills, and improve their knowledge. So today's session is, is focused on, as you can all see, government property management systems. Um, I should mention just a little bit about A to B tracking so you have some context for this. At A to B tracking, we build and install secure cloud-based government property management systems. And what I'm here to tell you is what we're seeing in the industry today. There is a growing importance for a complete government property management system. The expectations have changed. Um, we're being asked to move faster uh, as an industry with fewer errors and greater accuracy and oftentimes fewer employees or people to support us in these roles. And the only way to accomplish this is by taking advantage of technology. That's what we're here to talk about. A little bit of background we want to cover, however, so to build some context for this discussion. We're going to start by reviewing the motivations behind the need for accuracy and that efficient record keeping, which we refer to as FIRE. We'll talk about what the DOD needs, accurate data, and why. And we'll also address how DCMA is refocusing its efforts on the need for improved results from these audits and the important role of the PMSA. Now, we'll also discuss an update on government systems and how the reporting of key data is crucial. And we'll review the expectations of you all here, largely federal contractors, defense contractors within the industry. So at the end, what we expect to achieve is that you'll get an understanding of a modern government property management system and what that looks like and how it helps you do your job better. 
So let's start with uh, the directorate, which is the Financial Improvement and Audit Readiness, which is set in motion starting in 2018. The focus of this directorate was to focus on financial management by improving those internal controls and resolving material weaknesses and also advancing DOD's fiscal stewardship. You know, how, how does the DOD and the Pentagon take responsibility for all of the spending it does and all of the equipment it maintains in the inventory? Audit readiness for the DOD includes that of property, plant, equipment, operating material, and supplies. But it does put the highest priority on accounting controls and that accountability for the mission critical asset information, the information that you are gathering as an industry and maintaining every day for your federal government partners. Now, I said it began in 18. Truth is, is it actually began in 2011, which was actually led by the Defense Secretary at the time, Leon Panetta, who called this an, an on hands on deck effort, all hands on deck effort. Now, the commitment for that audit readiness was supported by, at the time, Deputy Defense Secretary David Norquist. So you can see sort of where the timeline begins. In 2018, when this really first kicked off officially to achieve a clean audit opinion, was by spring, we will have over 1,200 auditors inspecting DOD from book to floor and floor to book. Now, 18 came and went did not pass. And in 19, they said, we didn't pass. We have issues and we're going to go fix them. And in 2020, um, furthermore, the audit demonstrates progress, but we have a lot more to do. So the clean audit opinion has not been achieved, right? We probably all recognize this. But audits are going, in fact, to be the forevermore state for us. Being under audit, as he says here, will be the new normal. So can't emphasize enough the fact that the uh, between the Pentagon and Congress, they are committed to this mandate and it's not going away. And here's another little sidebar on this whole timeline. Much of this actually started back in 1990, where the CFO Act to, for all federal agencies to achieve a clean audit opinion was set in motion. So this really has been a work in progress for decades now. And it's getting it's getting more challenging as the years tick by. So more recently here in 2021, here's the latest update. Under Secretary of Defense Comptroller Mike McCord says, as in the past, our greatest challenge in the audit lie on the property side, the accounting for and evaluation of our equipment and our real property. So that just gives you uh, a frame of reference to the commitments and how this is just not something that's going to go away. Achieving that clean audit opinion and the unbelievable amounts of uh, defense spending that happen every year, you know, must be accounted for and they're committed to that. So every year there is an agency financial report that gets updated. And some of the points I'm going to cover here are for the FY 2021, this last year where it came out in June of FY 2021. So during that period of time, the DOD identified seven priority areas across 20 agency-wide material weaknesses, right? They just keep chipping away at this. And that one of the seven priorities is government property in possession of contractor. That is where the spotlight is being cast at this point. And a few, a few things that dig a little deeper into it, um, I'll mention that the components, right, the, the, the agencies, could not substantiate the existence and completeness of government property in possession of contractors. And that's obviously a real problem. So the DOD acknowledged its government property held by contractors as a weakness and provided its corrective, plaque, corrective action plan to the agency financial in the agency financial report. So the, it goes on to talk about inside this report that the DOD plans to continue its effort to validate and reconcile 
government property held by contractors. And then it talks about the DOD must continue to develop and implement new corrective actions related to properly recording government property held by contractors. So for example, formalizing the DCMA's oversight into DOD component processes with proper controls will provide the components assurance on the accuracy of the contractor's records. So that's that's sort of just the underpinning to why this is gonna continue to evolve. So let's address the property management impacts here. Improvement and audit readiness of information is essential to effective management of mission critical assets. So the focus on information in that statement is really crucial. The mission critical assets span the gamut from military equipment to inventory, operating materials and supplies, and general equipment, as you can see listed here. But the kind of data that needs to be captured and sent for the financial management asset information to be complete include the unique item identifier, the category and type of property or equipment, the location, status, description, custody, and then the controlling or financial reporting entity. So they make sure that they're not reporting the same thing multiple times. But all of this has to feed back from you into the DOD's Accountable Property Systems of Record, the APSRs. And the reporting entities must record assets in their APSRs, verifying that mission critical asset existence, the book to floor, and that they are complete, the floor to book. So you can see there's actually a tight tie not only between the physical nature of what you have within your custody, but also how that hits the books on, uh, you know, on the balance sheet. Now, along the way, also, there was um, this um, methodology for the government property that needs to be accounted for by contractors, by you, which is accounting for all serially managed assets using this item unique identification method. Now on the building and shipping side, the manufacturing of end item deliverables, this has been around forever. And it's been around, not forever, it's been around for over a decade. And, and on the property side, again, been around for quite some time, but really seem to have um, not this sort of um, massive expansion of adoption at first. It took some time for it really to get sunk into your contract obligation, but you should all be acknowledging the fact that um, when you see it, you, you know what to do with it. Uh, the item at a high level, the idea behind IUID is to make sure that the DoD is capturing and registering data for all its legacy assets, its GFP, GFE, and its newly acquired items that fall in this serially managed assets category. Now, the good news is that putting a barcode on it is the industry best practice for quickly and cost effectively identifying, marking, and tracking assets. You know, I'm sure many of you know that now because you know, you're using some form of auto ID technology that can help you. And it also contains item unique information, not only at the end item, but you may also see it as part of an embedded uh, assemblies or components that make up that end item. So it really kind of builds more of a hierarchical relationship so that when these assets get registered, you can see the final end item, you know, maybe like a gyroscope, and then some of the components that might make up that gyroscope that are crucial, surely managed parts of that asset. So don't be surprised by that if you see it. The whole idea is to create automation and the serialization lets you track down to that individual unique nut item rather than by batch. And that helps to enable audit readiness within that fire timeline. Um, the other thing to remember too is when you put a barcode on an item, you want to do it for the life of that particular item. You want to make sure it's durable enough to last the full life cycle of that asset. And those are some of the underpinnings, the tenants, to make sure that all of this works. But it really comes down also to the reporting obligation, which we're going to talk about here. Now, I'm also going to mention the DCMA guidebook. 
And the guidebook is a guide for DCMA, of course, um, to uh, be able to come in and evaluate a contractor's ability to meet the property management system requirements called upon within your contract obligations. As you can see, there was a first rev uh, that came out and then a, a, a rev one, uh, there was original that came out, and then a rev one in October of 2020. But the, but the PMSA is really a, a systematic objective review and evaluation of a contractor's property management system to determine whether it's providing effective and efficient control of government property and compliance with all the property, uh, property clauses, the contract provisions, and any voluntary consensus standards or industry leading practices, right? Um, so the frequency and type of PMSA conducted is determined by evaluating a number of factors. Um, and, you know, the PAs much, uh, must plan each PMSA and, and reanalyze to ensure that this whole process addresses government property accountable to all contracts admitted, administered by or delegated to DCMA, right? So anyway, this is a significant, um, there's a tremendous amount of definition if you're looking at it from the DCMA side to say, what is it that they are looking at? And, and so that brings me to this next slide, which really kind of helps to break down and illustrate the 22 elements of a, of a PMSA. And the specific areas that, I, that you see being called out upon are areas that really indicate where a government property management system with the technology that you have in today's modern systems can help to support you. So, for instance, you know, there's just there, there's there's a whole session alone in just talking about this particular slide. But a couple of the areas um, that are going to be uh, perhaps uh, more obvious for you would be number nine, right? The physical inventory. If you take the time in which to back up to element number six look at and understand really what your obligation is to identification of the property that's coming in and if it makes sense for you to leverage auto id technology in a particular instance you can gain huge downstream benefit of performing physical inventories with some kind of automation now it could be and many of the uh, companies we work with like to use mobility and like to use barcode mobility to walk around and track and scan a barcode that will be far more precise than doing it using some kind of manual method. There are also other advanced technologies that can take that barcode method for tracking and scanning and advance it even further to saving 10 times um, the return on the amount of time you spend performing physical inventory. In other words, if it took you uh, let's say uh, a week to do a physical um, uh, inventory using something like RFI technology that might be two months worth using barcode technology, which could be, which will ultimately be even more using a manual method. So there are lots to gain in, in thinking about the technology and where it can apply to the elements of this PMSA. You know, uh, that's another one. So. Other areas here that we like to take a look at is um, uh, disposal um, and, the re and the reporting of disposal. Um, that's another area where there's a lot of data being captured throughout the process. And rather than having to go swivel chair around and type it into another government system, with a couple of clicks, you can get all the data that you've already been harvesting along the way to be able to report directly in to these systems. So each one of these we could break down um, given the time, uh, but again, for another session. So that takes us to the role of government systems. And, and what we see happening here is these government systems are continuing to expand in their scope and in their capabilities. But what's not changing at all is your obligation in which to capture the right data and get it through to these systems. 
but really let's let's take a look at each of the uh, elements that could impact you on a daily basis one is the pi system which is the suite of government systems that enable these e-commerce transactions um, you know the other thing to note is underneath is where wide area workflow is. Um, we hear we work with companies all the time that are continually adding more administrative labor just to type in their wide area workflow transactions if they don't have the automation and that could be from invoicing to receipt and acceptance of new procurements for instance what also lives in there and i know many of you know is the gfp module for managing your atta attachments your shipments and your receipts and your updates and disposals again it's got to get in there somehow and if you're not automating it you are in fact using a manual prep method that can you know, always incur additional errors along the way and take a tremendous amount of time what's great about these systems is that the systems are in fact designed to have automation through what we'll call the back end of the system going right into the database. So you don't need to necessarily go through the front end e-commerce portal in which to get the data updated into the system. That's what a government property management system in today's day and age speaks to. How do you get that data with a few clicks right up to where that needs to go with the government? Of course, the IUID registry lives in there too. That's what produces uh, this uh, master data source for all GFP and uh, ensures that you know you've got all of the pedigree data about all of the equipment that you're registering and all those data elements um, as required by your FAR 52245-1 clause um, and then PCARs for your uh, plant clearance uh, automation as well but again there's you know the the goal here I can't emphasize enough that this level of government reporting is getting more complicated it's taking more time and it's and it's more challenging and the need is to be error free the data is critical it is what the government needs and for you to be as efficient as you can is going to eliminate not only today's problems but also as you continue to expand and grow and take on more uh, contract obligations and this little uh, fly-in from the left just says, exchanging data through a web portal is only one option, right? Direct EDI exchange or XML exchange is really a far more efficient approach to this. It's just to reiterate the expectations of industry. So the reason that um, I digress off of technology for a moment is just to emphasize that near-term responsibility of knowing when you're asked to open the door, you, according to a reasonable notification definition for audit purposes, you have 10 business days in which to respond to that. So that doesn't just mean, okay, we've got an audit coming up, let's go ahead and just do everything we can to tighten things up and get ready for this audit, let's get the data correct, audit readiness in the context of needing to respond to this kind of timeline needs to be a way that you just do things that you will always be continuously working toward that audit readiness state so the moment that they come knocking on the door you just open the door at, you know upon uh, defining when they're going to come in and that you're ready that you're continuously ready and prepared for these kind of audits um, obviously, they work with you as industry partners. They, you have to focus on how do you manage some subcontractor GFP. Um, but there, there's a balance here. But there's, there's nothing earth shaking about any of this. Um, and it's things that you've, uh, you know, that you're used to before. Of course, this was taken by, uh, this was taken from a, another DoD audit slide deck uh, Brian Sykes had put together um, a number of years back. Um, but you know what I hear periodically also is that it's not just about DCMA too. It, it also is about your program customers who want this information and they want the data that you have and are maintaining for your GFP 
and and so ultimately they wanted you know they want what they want they want 100 percent accountability because what's happening now is the components are requiring these programs to be have to have that level of accuracy now too so so that takes us to the definition of what we refer to as a modern government property management system and what it looks like so to begin with we talk about it being centralized, secure, accessible, and integrated. Okay, let's start with centralized. You know, on, on um, common systems of record, the record keeping itself has to be accessible nowadays from all locations that are responsible for accounting for this government furnished property or cap or whatever it may be. Having a centralized location, having access to that centralized location, and being able to provide that data allows not only real-time update of the record keeping, but it allows accessibility in a very uh, managed and controlled way from many of the organizations that we work with have multiple locations, multiple sites where property is being accounted for, and may have people where this is a full-time role, in which to manage the property or may just be a very small portion of their time. But to have that always going back to a central location has become crucial now. It also needs to be secure. So we know that the um, NIST requirements and controlled unclassified information is being pushed down from on high to make sure that they are in line with CMMC standards for knowing that whatever you're maintaining on behalf of the government, it is in fact secure. And uh, outside um, organizations that shouldn't have access to it can in fact not get access to it. So there's gotta be that security element that goes along with the way in which you store data. Accessible. So when we talk about accessibility, what we often refer to at A to B tracking is we're talking about um, the use of a variety of devices to capture information in the field or in the warehouse or in front of the equipment. We're talking about the use of multiple devices and how they're set up to capture that data, tablets, smartphones, even desktop computers and laptops like we're used to. The other is integrated. So when we say integrated, we're talking about how do they connect back to these government systems? That ability to exchange data, as I've been mentioning a few on a few slides now, back to these government systems. To eliminate that swivel chair, eliminate the silo of data, and ultimately save a significant amount of time. So it's interesting. I mean, all these stories come back to me along the way. At one point, we were working with, in fact, a DOD component that had three different inventory databases tracking exactly the same inventory. None of them were in sync. They were wildly different records and data. And there was not a single pot of truth, right, that had the right information in it. And what, what had to happen is, once it was recognized that, you know, they had to report all of this uh, to their APSRs, they had to have a single master data set that represents that single truth that could in fact be audited. And that's what can happen when you're managing things in spreadsheets or multiple systems that might not be dedicated to the use of the notion of this government property management system. And, and so we caution against that and, and how that can take you down a path where it's very difficult to unravel and it exposes you to corrective actions from within that audit. But we, it's, we can't talk about this topic of modern systems in, until we also identify a couple areas of automation, right? And I've touched upon it a little bit here, but you've heard mentioned the word auto ID technology. And auto ID technology, as we know when we go to the grocery store, is barcode. But it also could be expanding beyond that. Today, you may also have heard of the notion of RFID. What we're seeing now is that you know barcode automation um, has, is extremely successful, and you can see barcodes being applied to assets and equipment. But what's happening is 
they're not always using the barcode for the purpose of data capture. It may be that somebody's reading the actual human readable below the barcode and skipping over the use of that barcode. So where can you use the barcode? How can it make you more efficient? So for instance, you can scan an item to assign to a custodian. You can scan that item to assign to a location. You can scan an item, a barcode, to perform a physical inventory. And what's happening when all of that takes place is you know exactly what item you're looking at and you're touching in order to achieve those end goals. So to think downstream about how you can benefit from the use of barcode today is going to be important when, you again, you're continuing to take on these additional responsibilities and expanded responsibilities. Now, I'm also referring to RFID. So imagine if you could, for a moment, just see, quote unquote, your assets and inventory move from one location to another. We work in a lot of environments where there's engineers that come in and grab test equipment, and walk from one side of the facility to another. And then without the use of something as intelligent as RFID sensors, you would never know where that item went off into a location. You, you know, you, you, you walk around and start going, following the breadcrumbs, talking to people. Did you see this? Did you see that? Who last took it? Where did it go? Right? And that's a real time waster. And it shows a lack of, um, you know, the, really the ability to take advantage of technology that's very real today. Um, so not only is it real, but it's also affordable. So when we talk about the use of these technologies, people think, God, you know, I don't, I'm never going to get this past the bosses who are holding the, you know, um, holding the finances. And the fact is, is that all of these technologies are very affordable and, and can prove a strong return on investment when you take them up to, uh, to those that need to approve the finances to spend the money on. RFID is really remarkable because not only is it an autonomous reading technology, that when items are moving throughout the facilities, they can be seen in real time. But also, there are some even advanced versions of this technology where they can move designed within a robot in, an, a, say, a warehouse environment where they can scan up and down warehousing shelves. So it can give you a much more real-time picture of where the, what your inventory is and give you more readiness than you would ordinarily need. Okay. So the second part of this is the automation of data exchange with government systems. And we've talked a little bit about that quite a bit here later. So I'm not gonna go um, too much further into it other than to say is that if you're entering all of your data directly once from your whatever spreadsheet or whatever system you may be using and moving over into a government portal to enter it, hand enter it directly, you need to be thinking twice about it because there are ways in which you can send that data in a much smarter way and more efficient way behind the scenes through to these government systems to do what they are designed to do. So keep that in mind as we go here. And the, the next thing is mobility. So this can take many forms because mobile devices as simple as tablets or the smartphones we have in our pockets or those that are more sophisticated that have like data capture technology, the auto ID, like barcode and RFID. So what's really important for you to think about here with a modern system is capturing that right data or transaction at the point of activity, doing it once and doing it accurately, rather than going out and recording something and then coming back to a computer and typing it in and hopefully getting all of that right and the time it takes, so you can you can walk up with mobile and perform a you know a physical inventory with incredible accuracy and get it done once and have it communicating in real time back to your government property system. But what what is GPMS? What is government property management system not today? And it is not a spreadsheet. So here are the reasons why spreadsheets number one are not transactional so you cannot keep an audit trail of the same equipment and 
see all the transactions performed and who performed them using a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets cannot handle the use of auto ID technology. You might say, well, you know, Pete, I can go ahead and I can scan a barcode into one of the cells in a spreadsheet. Very, very awkward. And also difficult to maintain the quality, uh, not accidentally scan into different cells on the spreadsheet. There's so many things that could go wrong with even using barcode in a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets are not multi-user often. I know you could go into some form of a multi-user mode, but they're not intended in which to be um, real time and also you can overwrite each other too. Spreadsheets are also very um, error prone and I don't know anyone who's ever used a spreadsheet that hasn't said, wait a second, that's not what I entered that cell and had the cell auto format and change the meaning entirely of the information that was being typed in. And spreadsheets also cannot handle the automated reporting required to these other systems with one or two clicks behind the scenes through to these government systems. So really the managing, uh, you know, it's really about managing the risk to your organization, right? The contracts are, the, are on the line, the corrective actions, and how do you become more efficient for you as a property manager, or property administrator, which means having the right system for a smooth and successful passing of audits. So if your PMSA does not pass, you're likely to get a corrective action. It's possible that funds can be withheld. Now, on top of that, you've got your reputation as a company on the line and you, your department in support of that company on the line. So your customers, the program offices, need your data to pass their audits. When they knock on your door, you know, you ultimately need to be prepared. And it's a competitive thing too, right? So we, we work with companies all the time that say, look, you know, uh, putting in this property management system allowed us to gain a competitive advantage on a new contract or on the rebid. To, and to make sure that you're not in jeopardy of losing your existing contract. We've seen that before, too, with not having the right government property management system in place. And because of that, um, not being able to maintain, uh, you know, the, the award on that particular contract. And you want to set your contract team, your win team up for uh, future wins. But most of all here, and this is the message, is don't waste to get called out for not having the right system in place. Because we see that all too often where, you know, if you get called out and you digging out of a, of a corrective action of some kind, now you're not only trying to implement a system, but you're doing it on somebody else's timeline. And that's difficult to do. And under the scrutiny of the auditors who are gonna come back and say, you know, we're gonna come back and only get you out of this when we know that you've got a system in place that's gonna support it. So here's the message to your program and your finance, your, your finance leaders. And this is right on down the list, right? This is the story and the support that you're gonna need that if you tell them this story, you, you will in fact um, get a positive response. So the DOD is shining the spotlight on government property management and possession of contractors, right? We covered that at the, at the very top here, and that's what we know. Bail defense audits are in fact driving steeds, so this will continue to be the way things are until those clean audit opinions are being achieved, but then this is all needed to sustain those clean audit opinions. Your data feeds government systems, which feeds the APSRs, the Accountable Property Systems of Record. DCMA is formalizing their audit approach to PMSAs, adding pressure to implementing a modern GPMS, a government property management system, what you need. Now, this is also one of the six key contractor business system requirements too, according to the DFARS that you see stated there, right? And to have one of these systems is to know that these six systems 
can all or should all be interconnected in some way because sometimes you may have a, a weakness in one part of the system that can trickle down to another system. So that means in order to maintain these contractor business systems, they must all be represented as strong, proper systems that can support this. You would never go ahead and do accounting necessarily, unless you're a very, very small business, I can imagine, but even then, I can't imagine it, for your accounting system would not be done on spreadsheets these days. Right. So why should your government property management system be done on a spreadsheet? These are all part of the one of the six key contractor systems. So just as you no longer manage your financials, right? This is what I just said. Managing government property is not enough on a spreadsheet. So take the time to invest in a government property management system that is centralized, like we talked about, is secure, is accessible and is integrated that leverages automation for time for saving time and for accuracy and avoid putting your contracts at risk listen i want to thank you uh, for your time here today and once again uh kim uh, i want to thank npma uh for hosting these great events throughout uh, march yeah, of course. Um, so we do have a few questions, um, so I will ask them and then we'll wrap up. I have a few announcements at the end. Um, so one question was, um, do you know if the guidebook is currently under revision? Um, and then if so, do we, is there any anticipated release date of the next um, version? Ah, uh, good question. Um, I'm, I, you know, I really don't. I don't know if DCMA is in the midst of yet another revision from October 2020. Um, you know, if somebody else does know that and, and is maybe even from DCMA here and wants to chime in, that'd be good information to know. Um, and everyone's muted. So if you are on the phone and want to chime in, just put a comment in the question box. Um, right. <clears throat> okay, so I have a net, another question. Um, could RFID work for secure spaces um, such as vaults, data centers, and labs? Uh, so that's a that's a great question. Um, secure spaces have uh, different ways to define what secure, in fact, means. Um, a lot of times, our experience in putting mobility say into secure environments there's always a concern of um, devices that can capture for instance images and um, they don't like that in secure areas uh, being able to take pictures in secure areas so that actually in some cases almost immediately eliminates you know the ability to use barcode we've seen um, but, but what's great about RFID is that it actually is only using radio signal in which to capture a small RFID tag that's on an asset that is nothing more than a license plate. So that allows someone to go in using RFID to capture items in a secure space like a vault, like a laboratory. There's no, there's no reason why you couldn't use RFID in any of those spaces. Um, and you can capture just the license plate information, right? That's not attached to any asset pedigree until you, then you, you take that data and you associate it in a database somewhere that, that gives it its meaning. So we, we don't see any reason why you couldn't um, use that in secure spaces. The other way you could do it too is entering and exiting those secure spaces there's, there is the, um, the ability to mount uh, fixed reader sensors outside the secure area. If you didn't want anything going inside, you could see everything that does um, go through that egress and enters that workspace, whatever that space may be, the room, et cetera, data center. And now you'll know everything that came and went in and out of that location. So that's an, another way to do it without having mobility go inside. Or mobile computers go inside. Good question. 
Um, okay, I do have an update um, about the guidebook. Um, so it was reported um, that there are some changes that have been requested, but it has not been published. So more to come, I guess, on that one. Um, I do have one more question, um, and that is, can you explain the difference between a physical inventory and a contractor self-assessment and how often each should be performed? Oh, uh, well, this gets into some of the um, policy-related discussions and the procedures as defined. I'm not sure I'm, I'm the best one to um, define that, you know, because there's obviously lots of um, definition and rules written about those um, two. Um, so, yeah, no, I I, just, I I know how the technology can help perform them. I'm just not sure about how to define them as well. And I would welcome any input from somebody who may. Okay, um, here's here's one is, um, what does APSR stand for? Do you know what the acronym stands for? Yeah, that's the, that's the government's acronym for their um, accountable property system of record. So that's that's the okay. single pot of truth for all their property and equipment, the database. Okay, um, I have some more coming in, so uh, bear with me here. Um, do you know how um, clean audit is defined? Aren't auditors always going to find something? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, uh, defining a clean audit. <laughs> It, particularly at the at the DOD level, and and each of the components. Um, you know, I'm I'm not uh, I didn't author this uh, this policy or directorate, so I'm sure there's somebody in the financial side that could better better define that. Uh, but a clean audit opinion in layman's terms is is to be able to have the um, the books and then the physical inventory. Um, within reason be reconciled with each other uh, you know i just don't know what those tolerances are um so it's a good question though um okay let's see um do you have any predictive oh it's moving on me i'm so sorry you guys you're asking so many great questions it's moving um okay do you have any predictive uh, analytics that would support a cost saving business case um, as applicable to using an automated tracking system? Well, um, we have models um, that help to support it. So if that's kind of when I think maybe where the question's going, um, we look at uh, the typically the square footage of within the four walls of facilities and where equipment is um, oftentimes either used or stored inside facilities. We also um, talk about the, the quantity of uh, property that's being maintained and there's a few other variables that we would use. So if you came to us and said, okay, uh, A to B, here's, here's some of the inputs, we can actually um, we do have uh, models that give you where the return on investment will land for you. Uh, because what, at, what ends up happening ultimately is, um, you know, there's a certain amount of loss, uh, there's a certain amount of time wasted, all of those factor into the cost associated with doing it the way you're doing it today. And then when you compare that against an investment in this kind of technology, um, you can see pretty clearly that the payback is over a certain period. And and sometimes, uh, you know, it could be as a six-month payback. Sometimes it might be an 18-month payback. Um, you know, it just depends on what those inputs look like. But, uh, you know, ha happy to work with you if you want to go down that path and see what your model might look like. Thanks, Peter. Um, we are getting a few questions just more related to um, like how A to B tracking works specifically. Um, so I guess what I would recommend in that is to uh, take that offline, right? And have these folks 
um, reach out to you or you know through uh, the website and and ask those specific questions um, kind of how your system works um, and asking more of those specific questions if that's all right with you sure absolutely um, yeah you you can go to our website of course <laughs> and then and then there's a, a chat window you can you can talk to someone um, or there's a an email address that gets monitored hourly which is info at a to b tracking.com so info at a to b tracking.com okay thank thanks for that um extra piece um i am just still scrolling through here um i guess i'll ask this one last one probably is how customizable are auto tracking systems? Uh, so, so auto ID systems, um, they are they're very uh, customizable in the sense that you you can, depending on how you want to set it up, right? You can look at it and say, you know, okay. The majority of my equipment is coming in with say you know barcode license plates on them and i want to leverage all those barcode license plates that are there because it's going to match what in my database and when i do so i'm going to need a way to generate maybe more barcode license plates right to keep kind of this whole method going within my organization that's one one addition then you're going to say okay how do I scan the barcode and when do I scan the barcode? So you're going to consider mobile computers as part of the, the mix of that. And then the software and how it will interact with the mobile computers and write to the database. So, so that whole experience, the number of mobile computers, how you generate tags is a very configurable or uh, customizable approach. And the same thing is true with RFID. If you want even more automation, um, you know, how do you get a tag on an item at the right point in time when you're handling it? And then how are you tracking it? Is it with mobiles or are you using autonomous readers or sensors? Um, so, and what, what we always like to say is, look, there's, there's always a practical return on investment on all this. So don't get too worried about ultimately what the costs are going to be. Rather, you know, think through what the goals are for your business. And, you know, then ultimately you can start piecing those configurable pieces together and then you, you can, you know, you can sort of start somewhere and then you can increment and grow. But, you know, you don't have to take a huge bite of the apple on that. You can come up with something that may be more justifiable, easier to get past uh, the executive team and then and then have it grow within your organization. But we always encourage start somewhere right even if it's small very configurable anything else kim um yes thank you so much peter i'm going to go ahead and uh wrap us up um again thank you so much for speaking today great information um again if you missed at the beginning of the recording um the Slides are attached to the handout section of the GoToWebinar um, in your toolbar. Um, and then thanks again just for kicking off our webinar series um, and joining us today. Our next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, March 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Dr. Doug Getz will be back in action presenting the fundamentals of government contract property management. You can register for this webinar on our MPMA website under the Asset Management Awareness Month page or through the links that um, were in last week's news flash. Also happening this month, in addition to our webinar series, uh, we have kicked off our 2022 member survey. We encourage all members to take the survey and provide us your feedback. We will randomly be selecting winners at the end of the month for those who participated. Prizes include Amazon gift cards and a grand prize of $100 NPMA voucher. We are also excited to announce that we're selling NPMA men's and women's polo shirts all month long, and the proceeds go to the NPMA Foundation.
Polo shirts are $35 um, plus shipping and handling, and then they are delivered directly to you at the end of the fundraiser. You'll find all this information you need on our asset management awareness page. And then one last plug is for our 2022 Spring Education Seminar, which will be held in Cincinnati, Ohio on April 5th and 6th. There is still time to register, so head over to the MPMA website and book your spot. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed today's presentation and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks again, Peter. Uh, you're welcome. Take care. Bye.